Hello and welcome to the 107th episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Wednesday, the 1st of January 2020 and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. This week, my friend James returns to the show to talk about his experience of being a Labour member, momentum canvasser and radical Marxist during the election. We discuss our opinions on the fallout from the election, what were the strategic tactical failings and why we think return to Marx's critique of politics is essential. This week I have the new patron Luke Fontes to thank. You too can join the Patreon gang gang for only $5 a month, which works out at $1 an episode. Patrons get access to all the old Patreon bonus episodes, the right to vote in the reading group series and other cool stuff too. If you'd like to help out with editing or producing the show, you can hit me up on Twitter or Facebook. If you'd like to comment on the show, please do so on the YouTube channel and make sure to like, subscribe and share. You can also join me on Facebook or Twitter too. Okay, to the discussion. We have James here again who was at the Communist University and we did the review earlier and who should be joining the Brumaire. You going to be doing the Brumaire? I'll be there. On doing the Brumaire reading group series. So we decided we'd meet up and have a, a kind of a discussion about that as a post-election uh, analysis. So, James, you kick it off. You've got some things you want to say first. Yeah. Uh, first of all, let's thank Tom very much for inviting me back because there's a whole bunch of stuff I wanted to get off my chest. And Tom had uh, contacted me the day after the election because I'd been out getting out the vote in Harlow for about 14 hours. I walked 33,000 steps. Did we? the next... No, but we can get into that. There's a very interesting reason why. We can get into that later. (laughs) It involves foreign policy and international relations, but we'll get into that in a bit. But essentially, you got in touch with me the next day and said, you need to vent. And I was like, I need to vent too, but for various reasons I couldn't. So I couldn't get on that live stream you did. Uh, But since then, I've been reading and processing and stewing, and I needed an outlet. So thank you very much for uh, inviting me onto the podcast and allowing me to have that outlet because my wife probably would have kicked me out of the house if I kept on banging on her about it. So I fully appreciate it. So essentially, I think there's been a lot of analysis, a lot of uh, apportioning of blame. And I think people are often oversimplifying what is a massively complex and nuanced outcome. And I think strategically, one of the big takeaways is obviously it seems that Brexit was the deciding factor. But the ways that people are analysing how that affected things is causing people to take relatively binary positions. And I think that from the left, there's been two, maybe three (laughs) schools of thought. One is that there should have been an argument from the outset for a principled Lexit position. The second has been going back to 2017. So so you're saying before the actual referendum? Before the referendum and all the way through. So okay. people that people that have just been banging this Lexit drum. And I think that's actually a relatively marginal position. But these people are now claiming that, ah, oh, we were right all along. Then there are people who are the kind of respect the referendum result. And we should have gone from there and just respected it and argued for a Norway plus softer Brexit kind of deal. And then there are people on the left who are arguing that the only way that we could have won is by going hard remain and arguing from the outset for a Remain that was a Remain stay and fight and reform the EU kind of agenda, the Paul Mason kind of agenda, essentially. And I'm fairly convinced that none of those three things would have worked. I think whatever the outcome, you know, whichever route you'd have chosen would have still led to defeat because of the number of variables and the way that they stacked. So taking the the Lexit position initially, I think that, There's a level of delusion there in that even if you're someone that believes there could have been an exit, and I think the theoretical analysis that people are taking that advocate for that position is that it would have allowed for a form of socialism in one country. And I think that that is just completely delusional. We live in, as we know, an interconnected global marketplace. There's no way moving outside of the EU allows you to just set up into some kind of bizarre form of autarky. So I'm not entirely convinced exactly what they're arguing for from that position. It also fails to contest with the actual balance of forces at play. Are they they arguing for just like a 
a kind of a, a more state socialist, not state socialist, I mean like state capitalist 1940s Britain, you know, where you have large state planning, because I don't think they're even, they're not talking about a, a revolution. No. They're just talking about higher state spending as a percentage of GDP. Exactly. It's not that radical a position. And what that relies upon massively is the moonshot that, as a result of the conditions, circa 2016, that because of the way the election went in 2017, they're banking on there being a Labour government. And as we've been proven, as has been proven as a result, there is no Labour government. So if you move out, what we get now is the worst of all possible worlds. We get a Brexit that's being managed by a party that will literally probably go into some form of World Trade Organization aligned agreement, some kind of agreement with the US. And it's the antithesis of all of the things that they thought could be possible. So there's levels of which it just it just seems fantastical, their position. So I don't know how after the fact you can maintain that that was a logical position. I think I have a lot more sympathy for the people who are arguing that you know, if you steal man the argument that after what 2017, you, steel, you know, make, make the argument as, uh, as strong as you can. You know, if I respect the argument of someone like Edmund Griffiths, who's a Oxford academic, whose blog I read and has made a lot of good uh, points of analysis after the fact, he makes the case that if after 2017, Labour had continued to respect the referendum result, argue for a form of Norway++, plus plus, or whatever, a softer Brexit, essentially, you would have hegemonised the notion of leave being the only option and not open the door to remain. His argument is that by opening the door to remain, listening to the Another Europe is Possible People's Vote crowd, that slowly Labour opens the door and all of the remain liberal metropolitan elite forces that are at play then steer Labour Party policy and then thus close the door to Labour ever representing Leave as a constituency of voters. And I think there's definitely some truth to that. The problem I have with that argument is that it doesn't contend with the concrete material conditions of the actually existing parliamentary Labour Party or the membership of the Labour Party. It's just a fact that the vast majority of parliamentary Labour Party MPs and Labour Party members were of a Remain persuasion. So I just don't think it's as simple as Corbyn unilaterally deciding. And you've got to remember, this is a guy who, at best, the MPs that he could count on as being loyal, you could count on two hands, at best, maybe less. Would he, have, would he not have 30 or 40? I don't think so. Not who would unequivocally follow a line that goes so hard against the vast majority of the PLP and the membership. You're talking like... It's not I, just them, but it's also the country... And, and quote-unquote... the country. Not just, not just Labour voters, but voters who are backing Remain. And as we've seen, again, we can dig into the data, you know. One thing I'd like to say, though, about the Lexit people, like, I think there is definitely points to be made. What I would like to say is that the general idea of bringing self-determination is a positive left-wing thing. You know, my neighbour here, who's, uh, I think he's a, like a working-class Tory, would have been a Labour supporter probably early on. You know, he talked about, you know, we don't want Germans telling us what to do. And I think, to be honest with you, like, that is a thing that leftists should be backing. So it's not like there are some elements in it. The big thing about Brexit is that it was a nationalist expression. And you can't have a left-wing nationalism in an imperial country. Could you couldn't can't, you can't do it. You can't have it in Germany, France, Italy, Spain... Portugal, nationalism is always wrapped in a right-wing thing because you have to swallow, if you want to have a, a left-wing nationalist, like being a nationalist, like it's easy being a nationalist in Ireland because you've been shit upon for a thousand years, right? But being a nationalist in England means you have to swallow all the stuff that you, your nation has done. That means that it's always going to skew right. Just So I, I don't even think that Brexit could, no matter which policy... It could have been because it was always couched in in an, in an of imperial stuff. Native. Like even like but the Labour Party were anti it back in the day. But I how deep were they anti it? Was that I it, it strikes me that was just a political thing. I think I, I think against that, 
I like, think the critique the Tories that, at the time. I think the critique that the Benite wing of the Labour Party in the throughout the nineteen seventies and into the early nineteen eighties had of the European Union is the same critique that any principled leftist would have. And they, these are the elements of the Lexit argument that are correct. That it is a a tool for undemocratic neoliberal capital. That's just unequivocally true. Yeah. But w- along with that, and this is why I think there was a shift within the Labour Party throughout the eighties, is as Thatcherism kicked in, the European Union actually becomes a bulwark a against the factor. erosion yeah, of workers' factor. rights, yeah. human rights, environmental rights, and that's just unequivocally, it's just objectively true. So for all of the, you know, the arguments that the Lexic crowd made that you and I would probably agree with as Marxists and leftists, there are also undeniably countervailing tendencies within the European Union, plus there's the crucial element that you've highlighted, that it is a form of internationalism, and in an imperialist nation... In order for, like you said, any form, even the softest Brexit to get through, you're relying on the constitutive vote of the electorate, and a number of that electorate will be... It's a reactionary. Reactionary, vote. conservative. Yeah. It's just, it's just, it's it's simply the case. And Just so, like, our US listeners and stuff who don't know, like, America, England have, or the UK, I say England, because essentially, the UK is England. You, you see how it operates now. When England wants to do something, fuck the Scots. Fuck the Irish and fuck the Welsh, you know. So it's like when England, when you when you sign a contract in England, in European law, the maximum hours you can work a week is forty. But in UK, they can get you when you sign your contract, whereby they say you have to opt. In UK, has an opt out where you can work up to forty eight hours. And essentially, when you get your contract, if you don't sign that, you don't get the job. So in in the UK. Essentially, it's a forty eight hour working week for for most people, unless you're on on the clock job. It's an extra day a week, you know, and that's that that shows you that just to show you like that what might have actually ended up being in England could have been an awful lot worse if it wasn't for, you know, like that was one major opt out. But there would probably have been a whole lot of other things Thatcher would have milled through at the time. Absolutely. And I, I think staying with the um, the respect, the referendum result position, I think the other thing that you have to take into account is that. Had that been the Labour Party's position at this general election, you still would have had the option. It's like the Tory party with the, with the we are a hundred percent Brexit party, and any level of equivocation, which there still would have been, had Labour moved after twenty seventeen to the you know respecting the referendum result. I still think in a lot of those seats with the Brexit party existing and the Tory party existing, people that were really adamant about Brexit would not necessarily vote for the for the Labour Party. And I think, again, we've got plenty of data we can go through. And a lot of those northern seats, and I think this is also really important because there's been a kind of a, a narrative that has kind of concretized since the re- election result that it's this massive swing of all of these Labour heartland seats to the Tories. And when you look behind the data in the vast majority of those northern seats, turnout was down. And when you look at where the votes went, Labour voters stayed home or they voted for the Brexit party and in some cases even the Liberal Democrats so it's not as simple as traditional Labour voters voting for the Tories Labour, a lot of Labour voters stayed home or they voted for what were Brexit based alternatives to the Tory party and that helped split the vote and unfortunately because of the and this is a big thing that's worth discussing due to our archaic and ridiculous electoral system the way that those constituency seats are spread out made them strategically and tactically incredible targets for the Tories. And there are, again, there's tons of other stuff going on in the background in all of those seats. There's massive flight of young voters to nearby metropoles, massively ageing populations. So you have a complete change in the demographics of a lot of these towns within a short period of time. And I've got, there's a, bizarrely, I've got these stats from the Conservative Home website of all places, where they were actually my favorite website. Well, they were they were highlighting this as a boon for the Tory Party that this huge demographic demographic shift was occurring, and it essentially meant that they could target a lot of these seats. And this is a table of percentages of shifts in demographic between 1989 okay. and 2019. So in the last 30 years, and this is looking at you know the big seats that people talk about, so like Workington, which was one of the iconic yeah, yeah, seats Workington of the election, man. Workington Man. Right, so you've got the over sixty-five population between nineteen eighty-nine and twenty nineteen is up fourteen percent. 
under 24 population or 18 to 24 so the people that are you know matter for the election voting age down 28.4 percent berry over 65s up 27.3 percent 18 to 24 down 7.3 percent and on and on it goes bishop auckland which is a crucial one that again a lot of people spoke about over 65 population up 34.8 percent under 24s down 24.9 percent so what we again need is a, and again and again through we need all a of good, these seats. we need a, a really good new strain as a flu is this what you're saying we need like spanish flu redux yeah but this is a big problem I mean, you, you, you joke this is a big problem with having advances in medicine all of these people are living for I'm longer <laughs> listening listening to more lbc and reading more daily mail they're not listening to the lbc they're buying the daily mail no, nope. the Daily Mail is the big thing. I think the, they do this to LBC as well. They listen to Jimmy Hartley Brewer spewing bile. Well, that's only a London thing. No, it's national. Is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry, I thought it was London. Is it not like London? No, it's, it well, is that's full of remains. I'm sure well, they well, have... It's, um, it's full of James O'Brien and these people that are yeah. arch remainers. Is it like... Yeah, terrible stuff. Farage is on that, isn't he? Farage is He's on often on them. I mean... He had his own show on LBC. I didn't know that. I mean, I'm yeah, very bad at I'd never actually listened to the thing. But, you know, whenever I see clips of it, it's a load of... Who listens to radio, nonsense. though? Surely old people. Taxi drivers. I know They're taxi drivers. To it. So, so there's these demographic shifts kind of going on. On top of all of that. Oh, be almost behind and underneath it all. Yeah, like I was saying before, it's like set, I think the average turnout in London was something like 70%, even up to like, I think 79 in Putney or something very high. But in, in the Northern English seats, the ones you're talking about, I was looking at a number of them where they lost were 53%. Yeah. So not only was like, I think... It looked like the Tories went up 7% in a lot of these... Just I was one in particular I saw. The Tories were up 7% and Labour were down, like, a lot. But but not only that, it's like a load of the Labour people that didn't even bother turning up. It's essentially a large amount of... It must be older Labour supporters just said, fuck it. I think that's definitely true. I think the stat I saw was that 88% of the seats that swung Tory, the voter turnout was down. So 88% of the seats that swung, the turnout was down. So I think they massively profited from that. And I think, again, and I think another thing that's been, there's been some really good analysis also of how this isn't, this isn't, you know, it's been portrayed, I think, after the fact as being this quite sudden thing that's the result purely of Corbyn and Brexit. But if you actually look, and again, Bishop Auckland's a really interesting seat for this. It's, it's a linear decline from Blair 1. So this is, again, Bishop Auckland Labour majority okay. from 1997, so first Blair landslide year, 21,064 Labour majority. Blair, second time around, 13,926. Blair, third time around, down to 10,047. 2010, so this is the Gordon Brown, Brown catastrophe, 5,218. Ed Miliband in 2015, 3,508. 2017, 502. Corbyn won. Wow. 2019, lost. And that, again, that data tallies in many of these the seats. Democratic seats. Is, exactly. Is and there's a so, so it's like they're saying Brexit, but really it's demographic more than Brexit. Brexit is an expression of that demographic thing. And also in a lot of these seats, it's just long-term industrial decline. And I think there's another really interesting blog post by a guy who I follow on Twitter who's called Lewis Batson. And I'll, I'll link to, I've said to Tom, I've got a big old list of links that I'll try and uh, get in the uh, description of the podcast for people to read. He did a blog post about the concept of the red wall. And he said that, again, it's a massively inaccurate oversimplification of what's a massively complex picture that fits an easy narrative and he divides those quote-unquote red wall seats into two differentiated blocks one of the bellwether seats of which he reckons there's about 20 and he thinks that a lot of those are actually kind of swing seats and they're almost perennial marginals and they were kind of disguised by the fact that the Tories haven't really won an election comfortably since 1987 and so there are seats that had traditionally, up until the 80s, been swing seats, but have just kind of stayed Labour, and they were in that area. But the seats that really suffered are what he calls the mines and pottery seats within that red wall, where there is objectively industrial decline, these age demographics at play, and a rise in reactionary, nationalist, nativist sentiment within 
the working class. And there's another guy whose blog I read often, who's do you know Arthur Boff, Boffy. No. He's big in the Marxist kind of value theory okay, yeah. game. I found it, I found him because he used to comment on Michael Roberts' blog. He was this nutbag yeah, actually, who used to do now. massive yeah, yeah, no, comments. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I was like, what's this guy all about? And I started reading his blog. Yeah. And he does, he's written about 5,000 blog posts on the theories of surplus value. Yeah, yeah. But in amongst it, he does contemporary analysis. And I believe he's based in Stoke. So he's at ground zero of a lot of this stuff that's going on because Stoke Central was very much one of these seats that we're talking about. His argument has been that there is kind of a recomposition of the working class in these areas that have remained and that he also argues that what again... In the, have remained what? Have remained in that area. Okay, so the, yeah. the, the so working classes who've not fled, fled those areas. Yeah, yeah. And he he argues that there had always been a kind of a working class Toryism in a lot of these been, seats. There's always been working yeah. class Tories. And his, and his argument is that since the 80s and deindustrialization, that's now become the hegemonic working class position in many of these seats. And I'm not on the ground, and I don't know. And I'm always wary of kind of these grand narrativized statements. But it seems from the way that this election has panned out that there is possibly something to that. And it's, I mean, it is just, it is just really, um, I think, a lot more complex than this idea that there's just been this simple move of Labour people voting Tory. So I think it's important to kind of problematise and look at the complexities of what's going on. It seems more than abstentionism is the more overall, like if it's a, you know, it looks like it's quite likely there was 20% of people were abstained in a lot of these seats, pretty heavily will skew towards uh, Labour. That's a massive, that's just like an abstention disagreement policy. The other thing I would say is that, like, you have your capitalist class in England. Some of the capitalist class do just-in-time production across EU. That's a vast minority of the capitalist class in England. Most of the capitalist class are small business owners and the financial centre in England. The financial centre, they don't really care anymore about it. They actually probably at this stage, they're probably thinking, well, we can just go steroids, hedge fund of the world. And all you've all the newspapers, all of them in favour of it, except for the Daily Mirror uh, and the Guardian, who are a Romanian paper and independent, but they're so small. The independent is so small these days. But look at the behaviour of all the capitalist class They would prefer, as a whole, a further step on the neoliberal road of reduction in workers' rights and all that versus a state-led investment. And, you know, you see how all the parties behaved, like the centrist party, who were a Remain party. Their actual policy, how they did it, was saying they wouldn't go into government with Corbyn but they wouldn't say they wouldn't go into government with the Tories, which actually split the vote. And like at all points, you just have to look at the BBC establishment to see who they really have, really wanted to win. They, the capitalist class wanted this neoliberal step versus this state investment model. And they all backed it through, you know, through radio, BBC, papers, the vast majority of media backed it. And... That shows you that it's not just a Brexit election. It was also Brexit, not only as a tool to increase the rate of profit, but also as a tool to defeat a radical Labour government. So I I think, with hindsight, I I got a bit excited. I thought that the polls could have been wrong based on pollers I was reading. Yeah, and we won't go into it too much, but... uh, Well, no, I just think it's really important to pick up on something you said. Again, this is the point that Arthur Boffy makes often, is that... There are those two fractions of capital. And in England, in terms of the electorate, the small business holders, he bangs on about this figure all the time. I'm not entirely sure where he gets it, but he's convinced that there are 15 million quote unquote small businesses. And how he defines that and what, you know, where he gets the figure from, I'm vaguely dubious of. But be that as it may, I think it's it's objectively true that there are a lot of small business holders in the UK. Yeah. And for each of those small business holders, there are their families. And... I think a combination of that, and I think you're completely right, I have a friend who works in the city, and when I speak to him about this Brexit stuff, he's like, to be honest, okay. they don't give a shit either way, because we're making money either way, and on a personal level, voting-wise, you think those people are going to vote against 
paying less taxes? No way. Turkey's yeah. voting for Christmas. Yeah. So, to be honest, the financial centre of the UK and the small business holders lockstep into a, a pretty powerful electoral faction tied into all of the stuff we've just been discussing in these post-industrialised northern constituencies, which have a disproportionate effect due to first-past-the-post. And another point you brought up that I think is incredibly important, because I think as we move through the conversation, we're also going to look at, like, well, what next? And I think there are certain variables. Brexit, I think, is is going to be something that drags on, unfortunately. I, my opinion is it's going to drag on for longer than is going to be any good for any kind of a Labour government. I I think that the Tories can continue to use Brexit. Who knows? But this is my I, I think assume for a decade. Yeah, I think so too. I think this will be like Thatcher coming in, utilising the Falklands as a way of binding her vote as a nationalist project. And I think that any problems in terms of implementing the withdrawal bill or the political agreement will lead to Johnson again being able to make a re-election about tell them again and make it a power election again. And Labour, as they did this time, and we could again discuss, maybe they were tactical and strategic areas in terms of the way they tried to sell what are, relatively speaking, popular policies, but that is a retail offer. Here's a set of policies that can make your life better. And again, I think those things need to be set in stone, closer to something that we would perceive to be a minimum programme fought for over time, I think there's a big error that they just turned up with this big list of policies. But I think as good as the policy set is that Labour can offer, if the Tories can simply say, Labour aiding and abetting Brussels, they're preventing us getting out as quickly as we like. And I think the Tories are just going to be able to use that for a but long I think, period of time. Yeah, maybe, maybe, we'll, maybe they won't. I hate getting into the weeds too much on these political things because in the end, I've watched so much political shenanigan stuff over Brexit but like in the end he has a big majority yeah and like he can't complain about being voted down now he's got five years to to do all these yeah. major he has to own it. but he has owned it you know it was, it was good politics by him but one thing I'd like to say is that I don't know which will be released first this or I've done a three-part interview kind of thing on anti-politics with Grant from Swampside and a guy from Australia called David Rylance and he was saying that, you know, if Corbyn had have basically forced his party into line to go down the Brexit one, that he would now have a have a have a large majority. And I I, I feel like this idea of, you know, fighting your election or whatever against your own party has a certain it, it does work for politicians quite a lot like Trump did it he fought his own Republican base and he brought people in it but I think it's an easier thing to do from the right because they know you're right wing and they know you're still going to be doing capital but you're just positioning yourself against but if you're a leftist if you look at the anti-politicians who they who they, they described as one uh, the guy David Rudd in Australia he actually fought against the union hierarchy so he actually fought right much like like Tony Blair fought the Labour Party to the right. And what happened? He, you can get support from the media fighting your left-wing party to the right. But like, are we going to say that, that, that Corbyn would have got support as a kind of a, a fairly radical socialist from the Labour point of view by doing a right-wing Brexit? No, he could only do a kind of worker Brexit. He could have pounded worker Brexit, worker Brexit, worker Brexit. Yeah, but would he got the support in the media and from the the capitalists? I don't think so. I think it. I think it's no an way. oversimplification. Like I, I think there's definitely something in the anti-political stuff, but I think it needs to be teased out with respect to structural issues and yeah. why. If it was not a structural thing, why is it that what they call anti-politics works for right wingers? And left wingers who go to the right against their own party, it cannot work if you go left left against your own party. Well, we have to look at what Corbyn did. He essentially went left against his own party and got destroyed. I think know. I think it will always be difficult, and I think that's why I'd argue that you can use this as a concrete example of why it is problematic. Because again, it goes back to the structure within the parliamentary party, and I think this is where you have to give some careful analysis to the specific UK context in that 
as a leader of a party, you're still reliant on the MPs within the party to vote with you in Parliament on whatever it is that you're choosing to do. And again, there's all the parliamentary cretinism of what occurred in that Brexit period. But bizarrely, a lot of that, because it was holding up what was seen as an unpopular Johnsonian move to Brexit by the liberal media, was seen as actually, you know, a lot of the media class, actually, that was one of the few times where they kind of got behind Corbyn because he was utilising his group of MPs within Parliament to basically do a load of tricks and wheezes to hold things up. I think that in order for you to, again, hegemonise the position from the left, he would have needed to discipline his party. And again, there's a load of structural stuff beneath that that make that very difficult. You would need to essentially recomposite the nature of the MPs in the Parliament. Yeah. And he never... He came, he came in, and this is one of my biggest, again, zooming out, this is one of my biggest disappointments in the Corbyn era, was that he came in promising to democratise the party from top to bottom. Really, none of that happened. Yeah. He had to make a move from the outset, if he was serious about that, to move into open selection. One of the biggest problems has been that it took them literally years, three conferences, to get through trigger ballots in order to basically recall MPs. And that's a terrible mechanism because what that requires is a three quarters majority in each of the CLPs to even be initiate the process to recall an MP. CLPs being the constituency Labour parties. So three three CLPs. So three the, three quarters of the membership of the CLP, to including the including the union block vote, which can go either way. But okay. what that means is it's it's, it's really hard to. It's do. really hard because within even a relatively left wing CLP. So I'm in Campbell and Peckham CLP. And again, we could talk about momentum. I mean, momentum has essentially become a get out the vote electoral that's machine. It is. That's what it is. Yeah, literally, that's all it is. And as we've just seen, it's getting a- the vote out once, five times a year, if you're not arguing for a principled program over the course of that year and building a social base is okay, it's better than nothing, but it's not going to do the job. No. And the other thing that momentum supposedly have attempted to do is move into the institutions of the Labour Party, which is essentially the branches which sit below the CLPs and be able to sit on the boards of CLPs. Explain the structure here. So you have local branches, say, in Woolwich here, you might have a branch and then you might have another one, in a few branches in the same constituency? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So within the constituency, so using my example, I'm in Campbell and Peckham, that's the constituency, and Campbell and Peckham has six branches, and each of those branches will have delegates that can go up to the CLP and can vote on motions or any orders of business. And there are three CL. What did you say? Something about three CLPs? No, so that, well, we've, that was about that. Just in order to initiate a trigger ballot, there needs to be three quarters of three quarters delegates of yeah. the CLP okay, have yeah, to yeah. say yes, we want a trigger ballot. Yeah, yeah, okay. So what momentum have relatively successfully done is manoeuvre members to positions within the secretariat of these CLPs. So they might be the treasurer or the secretary or whatever it is. But in reality. If, like in my constituency, you have a centre-right MP like Harriet Harman, who's been there for a long time, who most of the constituents like, even if you can get the votes together for a trigger ballot, which is inherently a very antagonistic way, Mm -hmm. it's basically going and saying, you MP who's been representing these constituents for however many years, we don't want you anymore. And we're going to start a process to get rid of you. It's immediately antagonistic. And then even if you initiate the trigger ballot... There's no guarantee once the trigger ballot has been initiated that it should be voted out. I have a question for you then. Yeah. Like, could Corbyn have just drilled that down? Why could, like, I'm well, he about, should have moved to open selection. I know, but, is, but could he have, as Labour or Party leader, he can just say open selection, right, right, right a thing? Well, How other, was it? He, he, he essentially made other decisions of that nature. The problem with open selection, because it relates so directly to MPs' jobs, is that that has always been massively contentious but it would have been the only way that you could recomposite the party in terms of the MPs but the other big problem and this is the problem we keep coming back to is that because there's not really a social movement at play where are these left-wing MPs where are they coming from and who are they there is where is the left-wing MP that can come and step into Harriet Harman City in Campbell and Peckham you know I've been to Southwark and Campbell and Peckham momentum meetings and these people don't exist they, and this is what, again, we can, you know, we're jumping around a lot here, but this is a big problem. Is that so there isn't even, the people, there isn't, there isn't really the left-wing politicals. 
They just don't exist. So even if you move, and if they do exist, they probably exist in 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 truck groups or stuff that would be barred, wouldn't they? You know, if you're talking about you know, or or anarchist groups or or whatever you want, like the people who are left wing politicals, you know, they don't go and do. Uh, you know what is it? PLP and P P V P and CLP. No, uh, political oh, PPE. PPE. They don't do <laughs> politics, politics, philosophy, and, and economics. Yeah, yeah, they don't do that in. Yeah, and in, this in and this Oxford. is a big problem. Is that still a lot of the Labour MPs, as you've just identified, still do come through Labour students? They go and do their PPE or equivalent at Warwick or whatever it is, and then they're still a career politicians. And that is the composition of the vast majority of the Labour parties. To bring it back to the original point, it's very difficult when that is the nature of the vast majority of your MPs that you're relying on to actually vote through or strike down legislation, whatever it relates to, in order to hegemonise those people to a point of view that the anti-politics lot are proposing that is antithetical to the material and political and social interests of the vast majority of the constituency of the yeah. parliamentary Labour Party. Like, I think if, if Corbyn tried to do that worker Brexit, worker Brexit thing, like it's, it's quite likely just the party would completely have split. I mean... It, it did split. You know, got your tiggers and 10 yeah. and 15 went off. You know, the real reaction yeah. drags. Which I think is a good thing. And it yeah. was very good that it was also proven that they, they had, had a, an nothing. actual electoral constituency of nothing. nothing. They were polling at 0% from the moment that they split from the party. Yeah. And that's been one of the very good, the very few silver linings of this terrible <laughs> result was that those, there it's been, you know, it's, it's proven to, I don't think any of the media class will listen, but those MPs are the darlings of the media class. And it was proven that there is no electoral constituency for their form of politics. And the Liberal Democrats, in, in many ways it's bizarre, and again this speaks to just the absurdity of the electoral system. Their vote increased, more than doubled. But due to first past the post, they took a pasting on seats and they lost their leader. <laughs> so, you know. And did they, did they maintain any of the Tories? Did any of the Tories that come over to them? Or Labour went over to them? Took home and I didn't win a seat, did no. they? And I and I ran out and canvassed in the seat specifically for the so I could, <laughs> <laughs> I specifically canvassed in uh, two cities so I could canvass against sugar. But no, I think what they did was split the vote and allow Tories to get in. Oh, totally. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but uh, you know, but did they? Uh, so none of the did any of not the that, not that I know of. any of the people that went over to them did uh, any of them? No. I think I think all the Tories that went to them lost their seats. I think so. Like Sam Gima yeah. helped split the vote. Split the in vote Kensington. in Kensington. Yeah. And I think I, again and again that was essentially what happened. They they ran as soft Tories and ended up splitting the vote against the quote unquote proper. And I think that shows you that they knew knowingly did that as well. I think so. Yeah, I think completely <laughs> knowingly. I think you just have to look at. The Lib Dems, so they knowingly did that. Like all of it, we want a second referendum, second referendum. When when Corbyn eventually made the, well, could have been an error, could, mightn't have been an error of doing the second referendum. Then they said, "Oh, never go. When we, we don't back Jeremy Corbyn, we wouldn't put him into power." And you're you're so like, if you actually your your priority as a Lib Democrat was remain, or was it keeping out socialism? I <laughs> like soft socialism, twenty six percent corporate tax. <laughs> Socialism, you know, we're not talking about round up the the royal family and shoot them in their own garden. Socialism, you know, a communist. Where do I sign up for that? I know, <laughs> like, just here. <laughs> uh, when they had that choice, it, it was obvious from their strategy what their what their interests were. Yeah, they want to. They, yeah, the Liberal Democrats are a party that has no reason to exist. I was saying I was at a friend's party and I I, I kind of totally abused his wife without knowing that she was a Lib Dem I was, I was kind of drunk and I was going fucking Lib Dems I said yeah. they're like fucking Tories doing yoga and she was like I vote Lib Dem and I do yoga yeah. and I was like oh, no, well, they, they do essentially exist for elements of the metropolitan bourgeoisie to basically feel better about the fact that they're not voting Tory and all it ends up doing is enabling Tories but I think also <laughs> it's like, it's not, systemically it also exists as a way to siphon votes from parties and just there's a kind of like a, a, a self sustaining element to it. Like they were they were anti war when they could win anti war yeah. votes. You know, they're obviously to the right, but they, they, they work as a valve to keep to pull Labour to the centre essentially. Yeah. They they'll split their vote. Yeah. One one thing that I think it's important to dwell on, because I think there are certain variables that are unique to this election that could or could not have changed. But I think you picked up on the media thing. And it, that is a variable that I think 
It has to be taken very seriously by the Labour Party. Is not going to change. Gordon Brown got monstered. Ed Miliband got monstered. I don't think it's... I don't, if Keir Starmer or whoever it is, and we can discuss next leaders, because I think that's kind of interesting later on, but whoever it is, is going to get an absolute monstering. And, you know, there was, there's been credible statistical analysis after the fact of the Did media you know coverage. Today, there was one that showed The Guardian was the worst for the anti-Semitism. That it was the Guardian had outpo- uh, nearly doubled the amount of negative anti anti semitism stuff on the Labour Party than the Daily Mail. And it doesn't surprise me because then again, I think the Guardian is directly analogous to the kind of safety the, valve of the Lib Dems that you've discussed it. in the media. Yeah, it's essentially a media representation of, of that Dem. function. Yeah, yeah. It, it, exactly. And that is the only left wing paper. Like the Daily Mirror has bits, but like there are there Daily Mirror is actually a Labour Party paper. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 Gar- Corbyn, the Guardian and the Independent are both liberal yeah. organs. Yeah, like, yeah, com- yeah. Completely. Metropolitan liberal organs. But I think this, these statistics are nuts. So this is from uh, Loughborough University. There's a Centre for Research in Communication and Culture. And these stats are corroborated by another piece of research by the LSE that came out that Andrew Neil specifically Give said was a load of BS. But it was like, you know, <laughs> it's just objective academic reporting. But these stats are nuts. In the first week of the election, there was 71 percent of coverage of Labour was negative and 31 percent of coverage of the Tories was positive so Labour getting minus 71 percent coverage Tories getting positive 31 percent and that narrows towards the middle so Labour kind of goes six, minus 68 minus 75 then towards the final two weeks Labour goes minus 81 minus 96.6 in the final week and the Tories kind of dips to 17.5, 16.9, 11.9 in the third week, and then swoops back up to positive 30 again at the end. So you've essentially got these kind of like curves where, and I don't think maybe the Labour Party believes that like someone like Starmer is going to get less brickbats, but you can see it's already occurring. So I think the media needs to be taken, and it, and it is powerful. And I think, yeah, there's the anti-Semitism thing, there's also the concept of Corbyn being anti-nationalist. And this is another thing that Edwin Griffiths picked up on that I thought was really interesting, was that with Corbyn, if there's anything that people did know about him, including probably you and me, prior to him becoming the leader of the Labour Party, was that he was anti-war, pro-Palestinian, foreign policy was his bag. And since he's become leader, he's essentially had to kowtow to NATO, Trident. And I think that the ongoing drumbeat of reporting on the way that he's cast out on foreign policy I think has made people and this is a point that Griffiths makes and I think it's really interesting because people kind of know what he was about before and he's now saying well okay I'm alright with Trident okay I'm alright with NATO people are like yeah but he's not though and the two things I think that really afflicted him were a lack of everyone's like this guy's meant to be a principal conviction guy and all of a sudden the thing that he spent his entire career railing against He's now kowtowing the line on. And it's the same with Brexit. People knew. Again, he's a conviction politician. And up until throughout his career, people kind of knew that he wasn't into the European Union. And all of a sudden, it's clear that his party's moving towards Remain. And it was also clear that his heart wasn't in it. And so there's a lot of reporting from people who are out on the doorstep in 2017. I mean, I didn't hear this on the doorstep in 2017, but a lot of people said, you know, you'd knock on someone's door and they say, oh, I'm voting Tory, but tell you one thing about Corbyn. At least he fights for what he believes in. And this time around, on the doorstep, Dear people were like, who is this guy? So him being, his brand, his selling point, was that he was principal conviction. And then on both Brexit and foreign policy. And foreign policy is a thing that like a lot of people... Yeah, but it's hard to know. like Because if he kept his thing on the foreign policy, he could have alienated a lot of his Absolutely. labour base. Yeah. So people, you know, and I'm sure that's the political decision. You know, people make these choices. Let's let's move it along a wee bit. What are we? What's next? I think looking at it kind of with a wider lens, I think you just have to contend with the fact that because of the moonshot nature of Corbyn becoming leader, yeah, you, you there was a lack of any, and this is what really needs to be contended with. You mentioned before, before you say, you mentioned before somebody before we we start recording. They tried to jump over... This, this is, again, yeah, so Griffith, yeah. Griffiths. So, essentially, he, he, he came up with this term that it was a, a great leap over the institutions as opposed to a march through the institutions. 
So you have this situation where there's a relatively atomized left. All of a sudden, Corbyn becomes leader and is parachuted into potentially a shot at number 10, an executive power. But that has leapt over there being the building of any real social movement or political movement around the project. And it's done a lot to galvanise an activist layer, some of which are members of Momentum, some of which aren't, but a lot of people who, utilising myself as an example, people who are willing to go out and canvas and door knock for the party when there's an election and maybe turn up at CLPs and vote quote-unquote the right way for whatever the left are voting for in their CLP. But the stark reality is that that is simply not enough on a long-term basis to sustain a challenge to what has been proven to be a very difficult to remove and hegemonic Tory party. You are simply not, by parachuting in a small coterie of left-leaning leaders without the social base behind them or the social movement behind them and a reinvigoration of the Labour movement behind them and the institutions of the Labour movement, you're simply not going to be able to sustain that kind of a challenge. And I think that that has got to be one of the big lessons from the fallout of this election, is that it was a moonshot, a shot to nothing, and it didn't have the undergirding to sustain it. Well, the first one was the... I was say the first election was the properly... The first moonshot, wasn't it? This was like moonshot in, in, in worse conditions. Yeah. Yeah, totally. To me, it's like the fact that all these places up north went to Tory, uh, people are saying, oh, that's a, a political error. And it's not a political error. Maybe it's a political error. But it's it's more deeply, it's showing what's not there than what was there. Go back to the 80s or something, or the 60s, or the 40s, or the 20s, when Labour were coming up in these mining towns. And there's no goddamn way some little policy over, like, a bit of Brexit or not a Brexit, something that, in a vast scheme of things, is pretty insignificant for a country. I heard the guy, James O'Brien and LBC, saying, you know, economists have come out saying, you know, our, our GDP is going to be 15% below in 50 years' time. And you're like going... Who, what economist would you believe making a 50 year pr- prediction <laughs> you know, no, never, never mind a 3 year prediction it was like something that may affect your GDP by 1 or 2% one or other of the way in the grand scheme of things they do policies that do that all the time yeah. and famously at the last election when Theresa May stood in front of uh, the shop stewards and members of a car factory talking about GDP they said your GDP you know on the level for those people it's our job it? yeah yeah and it's like so like in the grand, grand scheme of things, Brexit is not the problem. Brexit is just a, a, a thing that showed how... It's a symptom how, of a set of causes. Yeah, but also it, it just laid bare what the actual social structure is in these northern towns. They're not highly organised, you know, unionised people fighting collectively for their rights, looking after each other, having a sense of solidarity. Yeah, oh, it's gone. It's completely gone. They have historical memory. That's it. You know? Couldn't agree more. And I think that's the big problem. And I think that's going to be the biggest problem, again, linking it back to the electoral system, the way constituencies are drawn and first past the post, is that this massively benefits the Tory party going forward. Because that, due to all the things we've discussed, what you've just mentioned, the complete lack of any yeah, kind but, of community. But look, these things always favour the Tory party. But you know, what they have to do... what Like in, every left-wing party that ever came up always is at a disadvantage in all these things in history. So like... Uh, you know we were doing the McNair series and I kept on going back to PR and stuff and after a while I was thinking to myself this is just bullshit the Labour Party for example came up through the first part of the post system and they, they'd gotten majorities through that radical Labour like radical you know reasonably radical social democrat Labour in 45 you know they, they came in they set up the NHS and they did it with all the things against them you know, but they maybe, did it on the back of the kind of social movements yeah, and totally, community structures within those communities. Yeah, so yeah. Re, but rebuilding those things yeah, is such a task. huge. But that's the task. task. No, I agree. But that, but I think that the all the rest the, of it is just political rubbish. I, I, I mean, the stuff we'll see about which leader, this that, and mm. the other. Like, essentially, you're you're stuck in this. You're stuck in this rut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's a Westminster a, conversation as yeah, opposed to being a as conversation opposed to an actual. About, it, it's an idea to of politics class. as yeah. a, a class of Westminster as politics as in sitting on top of a social structure in the country. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. Well, what I've got written in my notes is what we need is S and M, the merger formula, <laughs> S and M, <laughs> socialist <laughs> movement and labour movement, and that is the job of patient, consistent, considered, strategic, long term work, and it's all the stuff that has been discussed in the McNair book. But I think that there needs to be some consideration about, depending on what pans out, whether the Labour Party is even the organ for doing that, and that again goes back to, you know, discussions we've had around the McNair thing. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, but but if it but if it isn't, where does that come from? And that's the thing. That's the thing that's got me depressed and bummed out. Is that where does where does this come from? Well, it comes from society. I think like the the thing is right. You know, I was just shocked at the results when it came through. As in, I didn't. I kind of I thought it was fifty fifty a minority Labour SNP government. So it took me a few days to get out of the stuck out of the rump. But you know, then you got to kind of go to your long term class analysis and structure and stuff. But it's like these are long form issues and problems. I would like to bring it back even further. I was saying to you beforehand is like this idea when Labour became a party that went to wanted to manage capitalism. Whatever we critique about the SPD and what happened in the end in World War One, whatever. But when they stood separate, the heyday of radical politics in the world was when the left said you run the state screw you we're only going to take over the state when we have a majority and we're going to put our minimum program in and then we're going to have our revolution essentially yeah and this idea of becoming the the social democratic party that will manage the state is inevitably going to you're going to have to manage the crisis of capital you're going to have to manage the falling rate of profit what are you going to do? You've got two options. You've got, you can go to a planned economy. You can do MMT this way. You can do it a, a cockshot input, uh, input output tables and you can plan it that way. If you want to go and manage capitalism that way, you could go to that way. Or you can go the neoliberal route. Or I don't like the neoliberal route. You can go the capitalist way whereby you increase the rate of exploitation. You move production to where the exploitation is, is greatest. There are, there are two options as a social democrat. Your man's, what's your man's uh, name? Kaleski's paper on the problems of full employment, I can't remember the name. And, uh, you know, he talks about why the capitalist class will always go for increasing the rate of exploitation. Yeah. You know, core key ones. So then you're left with, if they increase the rate of exploitation and then you have to manage the increase in their exploitation, you'll destroy your base or you'll get destroyed anyway through that process of increasing that like like all the unions got destroyed in England once the capitalist class went we want to increase the rate of exploitation so where are you then then you're stuck in a rut and you're like the socialist party in in Spain or you're like the socialist party in France or the socialist party in Germany and they're all just getting votes on a moral basis yeah it's moral voting 100% and it's not it's not uh, material voting yeah and I couldn't agree more. And I think that's why those are the two big things I have highlighted. S&M and some form of a a policy set, a program, a manifesto that is closer to a minimum program that's argued for consistently over the long term. Over 50 years. Like, And the thing is... That has to be the only answer <laughs> in the long term. And it, But I do not... This is the problem I have, you know, that gets me depressed and, you know, bum. Is... <laughs> I, I do not see that coming from the Labour Party, but also I don't see where it comes from outside of the Labour Party. Yeah, but I think, you know, who, who, who was the party before the Labour Party that all left-wingers went into? It was the goddamn Liberal Party. That's who, that's who it was. It was the Tories and it was the Liberals. Even even the, I think, the Irish ones like Daniel O'Connell and Parnell and these guys who were trying to get emancipation, I think they blocked with the Liberals. Gladstone, even though Gladstone fucked them in prison, right? So it's like, and at that stage, the Liberal Party was hegemonic. You know, it was the Tories. It was literally, they weren't hegemonic, but they were the two big parties. And then Labour came out of goddamn nowhere. But it has to come from society. Like, and I think it's really ironic (laughs) that we're like going all the way back to like 18, fucking 80 or something with with Marx and critiquing the SPD. And it's it's this long political error. And, you know, Marx talked about, it was funny, I've been reading that Teeple book, I know you bought the mm. Gary Teeple book, yeah. there's an element in it where Marx talks about how could he come up with his critique of politics. So he's basically talking about this 
he was talking about how politics was standing up and opposed to society and it was a managing of the contradictions you know the political political sphere both wants to uh, alleviate those contradictions but still at the same time keep them in in place it wants to remain the capitalist class and it wants the the proletariat to stay there but it wants to somehow manage and st- it stands above society and regulate it and he was saying he basically basically you have to just get rid of politics and get the politics back into the social element and so he, he was saying this and he was saying like how come i was able to do it right and the french weren't able to do it and you know other people weren't able to do it when they, they had their theories or revolutions and stuff and he was going like you know well uh, it's, it's like brilliant it's like a materialist explanation of for his theory is like the french revolution and the american revolution showed that they perfected this idea of the political state the political ideal they they said oh what we all want is universal vote you know everybody having a vote equal rights under the law blah 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 and they got it in the end they got that and 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 did it work no you said look <laughs> this is the problem with it yeah. Yeah? yeah and so that's why he was able to come up with his theory okay but like why are we returning now to his ideas on politics of 1870 it's because we've seen the long haul 150 or 130 years 40 years error in the political decisions in the vast majority there's nobody there's no parties out there going there's no parties that are anyway meaningful that aren't 12 boys sitting in a always men sitting yeah. in a, sitting <laughs> in a room nah, I think it's so true but I think for me it, it does come back to I think the Labour Party could still be a vehicle to move what we're discussing but I think that's where it bizarrely does come back through to the nitty gritty parliamentary cretinism of how does this occur? Because if you look at like where it goes next, it would require a leader who has a commitment to the strategic vision of committing to. They'll never those do things. that. But that's but that's my point. It's, but right. if it, it can't structurally, you can't get a party of politicals who go into politics for power now and moving themselves up, and it's very very ego driven stuff. You know, how many Labour Party politicians? are really conviction politicians. What would again, you say? I would say, again, you could count on two hands at best. Yeah, like prob- yeah, probably 10% of the parliamentary party are maybe 20%. But like, I'm sure some of them will have certain stuff, but like... They're all compromised by capital to some lesser or greater degree. Yeah, and, and usually by a huge <laughs> yeah, degree. Yeah. Like how many of the Labour councillors here in Greenwich aren't ah. tooth and nail, ah, arm property arm developers with property developers? Yeah, of course, yeah. If they're basically a property development party yeah. in, in Greenwich. Yeah. You know? I mean, so that where I am, you know, so that it's been, you know, the Haygate, the Aylesbury, people that were on the Labour councils in that area now sit on the boards of the property developers. Of course It's been do. literally like a one-to-one yeah. relationship yeah. throughout. And like they've been called out on their BS and they have to be a bit more careful about it. But still locally... That's, that's know, what it is. It's a step. Yeah. Yeah. It's like when I was in working in Ericsson's. And in the bank as well. Like, they would actually get you to join the... In our sense, you had to join the union. Yeah, I've heard you mention that. Yeah, it's the Marine Corps General Workers <laughs> Union doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. But it was a way so you would do. They'd say, you've joined the union. Yeah, you be, if you become a, sh- a shop rep, you'll get, a, you'll get a management role out of it. Yeah. You know, and I think that's the same with local uh, labour people in loads of different places. You get him, you get him to developers, you get smooth and smooth, and you get a job and up and away you go. You know, you got a lot of connections. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I mean, but the, but but then, but what do we? And this is this is what I struggle with. It's like I'm a, I'm a member of the Labour Party. I'm a member of Momentum, and part of me thinks, what is the point of me even turning up? You know, but Momentum's not democratic, is it? No, not at all. Yeah, but this so, is but this is the but again. It goes back to Momentum has completely failed in what it set out to do. In that all it's really become is a, a pretty good mobilising tool like these for American, canvassing. It's like when these American like Democratic Party, what do they call these fronts, like uh, Move On dot org or something. That's yeah, that's what it is. Or like Our Revolution, which is the thing behind the yeah. Sanders. But again, it's, it's very similar to that. And yeah. all it does is get people to go out and door knock. Yeah. Which is not, it's not, it's been categorically proven to not be enough. And I, I even think, as I was going back to my local CLP in Campbell, even when you get people sitting on the secretariat of these things, yeah. because of the structure of the party, at conference, the executive can always overrule what comes up through conference floor. Yeah. So even if you take, quote unquote, take over the CLPs, 
because of the lack of democracy within the party, it can still be overruled. So democratising the Labour Party would take an executive decision, which was always promised at the beginning of the Corbyn project and never happened. And I think that, that to me, beyond you know, the policy set, if, he, if he'd committed to that and executed it from the beginning, that would have been a really positive legacy. And as things stand, there's some moving of the discourse in the Everton window, yeah, maybe. But beyond that, I don't see that much positive legacy, I've got to be honest. But like, maybe that's just me being pessimistic at the moment. It's hard to see, though, that... I don't know, like, what percentage of the Labour Party membership are Corbynite? 60-40? It's difficult to say. I mean, I think you can look at the, you know... the, the, the re-ele- last The re-election in 2016, it was pretty convincing. I can't remember, it was, like, 65 70%. Okay, so, yeah. like, say if it was 70% then... yeah. After a big failure like that, you know there's a lot of fair weather fans in these type of things. Oh, yeah. Like, and also, we've already, will it go down to? we've already seen that the blue Labour, open Labour, all the centre-right Labour yeah. factions, there's been a, there's been an influx of twenty to 30,000 members, all of which you can pretty much guarantee are people that left under Corbyn who are coming back, like, you know, for sure. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and that whole blue Labour thing, I mean, it's just like nuts. That's basically just like, oh, all we need is like a little bit of racism to win back those northern seas. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, it's just depressing as fuck. It is depressing. <laughs> It's been, this has been exercised. Well, I, don't, I don't think they have any hope, though. But they, like, no. but like the thing is, who are these people that are going up? You know, when I look at the people that were put forward for television interviews and debates, I found a lot of the left party that people are put forward really poor. Oh, yeah. Like, is it Richard Bergen or some of yeah. his name? He yeah. was really yeah. like I would. I'm not joking. What, I would do much better with no prep. Yeah. Well, one of the few good MPs was Laura Pidcock. Yeah, she who could lost. actually make cases she lost the seat. Yeah, yeah. So one of the few good young working class voices yeah. in the party that could make the case has lost the seat. Yeah, Angela Rayner. I think she's reasonably. She's good fine. As well. well, I mean that that's essentially the ticket for the left. But I also do think there's a, it's Rebecca Long Bailey and Angela yeah. Rayner are the kind of the yeah, ticket yeah, yeah. for the continuity Corbyn. Yeah. But I think there's a bit again. There's a big problem if you just go continuity Corbyn and there's talk. And again, this is getting into the weeds of the political stuff. But there's talk that a lot of the back office staff are going to keep jobs and all this stuff going around. I think that would be again a strategic error to just continue Corbyn not look at say the policy is popular all we need is someone who can sell it better and we need to learn the mistakes from the last election outside of uh, this particular election it was unrelated I was listening to a podcast where an American political analyst was talking about the Democratic Party and the Republican Party and saying that the Democrats are always fighting the, the errors of the last election whereas the Republicans look they're more Marxists. <laughs> They're looking at the conjunction, the, the conditions. And it's just exactly what the Conservative Party did in this election. They looked at the circumstances and said, how do we win given the current ground? And I fear that if Long Bailey or Rain or whoever it is who's the continuity candidate, they just say, oh, the policies are popular. We just need better messaging. And it'll fail again. Well, that's, that, that, that's, that's essentially what they've come up with. Like I was watching one of the post-election session thing on Novara. I'm always slagging off Novara, but I do watch it. Like, uh, But they... They they uh, said they had a guy on who was basically saying that they 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 basically messaged it wrong. They had fifteen policies instead of three or two, and you're like kind of going, you know, that's the level of analysis is that we message the thing wrong. Look, these are long form problems. They're not small form problems. People now think, oh God, what's going to happen? Look, people who are in the CPGP when we're at the Communist University thing. Imagine how those boys felt in 1991, half of them. They were probably close to, like, hanging themselves with fucking depression. <laughs> like, literally, that whole Leninist, Soviet, 100-year experiment, 80, 70 year, has just crumbled. Totally fell on its face, you know? But who would have thought then, 25 years later, radical politics has been... Is on the. It's been revitalized, certainly among the youth. You know, you look at so the bright spot, if there is a bright spot in that election, was like Tories under under like forty five. I think it was two to one against Tories. Yeah, you know, you might have the exact stats, but uh, yeah, it's it is crazy. The thing, the thing I was uh, and it basically flips once you go over forty five. Yeah. And I think a lot of that is memory of Thatcher and things like that. I think those people who voted Thatcher or, or lived through that crisis in the 70s and 80s and have actual memory of it, I think those people switch from one camp to the other. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, that is one thing that you do get on the doorstep from older voters is 
I remember the seventies. I remember the three day week. Yeah. You know, and okay, they have a their their popular memory of it is not aligned with, you know, the way that it actually economically played out, but that yeah. is their experience. And so you can kind of you know, it, it can be understood at that level. But yeah, I mean the the, the only other thing I mean with this has been a great uh, therapy session, but it, what the, the only other thing I think is important to raise, and I think like, you know, especially for people not in the UK, is just how within, you know, however long it's been, two weeks, the amount that has already occurred in terms of what Johnson's doing. And I think this is the thing. This is what bummed me out. When I was on the way from getting out the vote, on the train on the way back, I was with a lot of other canvases, just like some of them like literally in like tears. And I was just thinking like, there's a lot of people that are going to get screwed in the next week. And in the, this is just a laundry list I have. So one fifth of all the Tory MPs in the latest intake are former lobbyists. And within days, there was a four billion sale of a major defence contract to US private equity. They've rolled back on their minimum wage commitment, saying it will only happen depending on economic conditions. They've completely gutted oversight powers of MPs to scrutinise any of the post-Brexit trade deals. They're passing anti-labour legislation, so they're trying to basically ban the RMT from going on strike. Uh, at the UN COP25 conference, it you know completely failed, and Johnson's committee to rolling back on all environmental protections that he'd made gave lip service to. He's also committed to increasing the number of flights in and out of the UK. There's going to be there's essentially voter suppression because they're now saying that in order to vote you need a, a full yeah, photographic ID. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. but like 3.5 million people don't have that, you know. And this, and again, it's gerrymandering of seats. They're going to redefine all the constituency boundaries. Well, like you know, the thing is when a when a party comes in like that, they they say a hundred things. Yeah, and then you know some of them will get through and some of them won't. And you know, this has been a week. I know, but they haven't done them. They've announced that they want to do them. Is now yeah. that's their wish list. Yeah, but you know what I mean. And what they'll do is. Because like people get so outraged by one or two of the things, they'll say as a soft, they'll say, "Well, we won't do that," and then they do the rest. Yeah. You know, so who knows what'll get implemented? But like, honestly, it's the same every time a Tory government gets elected. Yeah, it's man. no different than any of them. It's just real. I mean, it's like, just real. It's real because it's happening, and it's like you know, Britain, Britain first have basically advocated, you know, join the Tory party. You know, the level of like, you know, countless incidents of like, you know, street racism, people posting videos. You know, all of that stuff is going to be enabled. And that's the thing to me that is like the bummer. Yeah. And that's like the real material consequences of... Oh, there's loads of material consequences. <laughs> you know, of this I don't, complete you know, failure. It's a complete failure, but it's the same as it ever was with these Tories. It's like, um, I mean, as in, every time you fail against them, they do this, it's the same thing. I think yeah, bring the hammer down. For some down. reason, it, yeah, they just bring the hammer fucking down. Yeah. And especially when they've got a majority. Yeah. They'll bring the also, hammer down more. The other one is someone who grew up in the Richmond Park constituency. The absolute bonapartism of Goldsmith losing his seat and then being given a seat in the House of Lords and sitting in the cabinet. Oh, yeah. That is just like, that's literally just like them just going like, yeah, and laughing at us. Yeah. It's like crazy. Yeah. So then I had to rail that off. This is getting stuff off my chest, my Alpha to Omega therapy session. <laughs> It's depressing, but uh, like so, strategically, yeah. For for good things to come out of left wing politics, bad stuff has to happen to us. Indeed, you know, for good for good to come out of the Soviet failure, the Soviet Union failure was baked in the cake. Uh, you know, Chomsky says he said that like, you know, the failure of the Soviet Union was the was like the, probably the best thing to happen for socialism in the last hundred years. And like in some cases, it was a, some, some ways you look at it, it's a disaster. Millions of people died, blah, blah, blah. But like strategically, even though there's a lot of weird old tankies <coughs> out there, like strategically, that had to fall asunder for something else to come along. These things, are, I think, are multi hundred year phenomena. Hopefully, you know, we won't all be on a a methane planet, you know, by twenty. Indeed, and we've not even we've not even we've barely yeah. even touched on that. And I think that that's the thing is that we do kind of. That's what this. that's what excited me about Corbyn, to be honest with you. All the rest of it, it was literally a green new deal. I yeah. thought that was that for me. You know, yeah, I'm a white guy. You know, middle class, not middle class, but like you know, mi middle ish, classy upbringing. You know, oh look, he's in, in, interested in the environment. You know, it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like. You know, but like I thought, like kind of a, as a strategic thing for the world, the first major economic country to do a zero emissions Green New Deal radical thing was something that could have been 
then taken by other countries and they're left and Britain pushed through. That was that was yeah, could the been major thing, a generally yeah. transformative yeah. thing that could happen. Yeah. Not on a socialist scale, just on a capitalist scale. Let's get the fucking carbon thing sorted, yeah. lads. That, to me, was why I was most excited, obviously for all the other stuff as well, but I thought like that could have the most international impact. Yeah, absolutely. And that's all, you know, five years, probably a decade now in the back burner. Yeah. Literally on the yeah. burner. <laughs> yeah, big bummer. So what hope do we find out of all of this? Uh, for me, it's just a, like, a, a, you know, maybe it's because you were in our small, weird old Marxist clique where we're in an obscure podcast. But for me, it's like a... A means of clarification. A clarification and it's and it showing you why this error is is happening. And, you know, I do think like after long periods of time, different ideas burst through eventually and particularly because this was a inverted commas far left kind of push on this model that you know that maybe the work of people who are rereading early Marx and about SPD and stuff like this that maybe that in 20 years this might become somewhat hegemonic on the leftish scenes because at the moment it's totally not you know but to be honest with you what we're saying about this kind of stuff, I don't know, because I'm not in the left scene for like 20 years or 30 years, but it feels like this uh, has getting a lot more play now than it was even five years ago or I 10 think, years ago. I think absolutely. I mean, it's my, my sample set is anecdotal in that it's like people on Twitter, but there are people who are like, you know, 10, 15 years younger than me who are like posting up, you know, screenshots of the kind of stuff that we're reading. And there's like, no way when I was in my early 20s, there's like anyone outside of maybe someone who'd been recruited into the SWP, you know, at university that was reading any of that stuff. Yeah, it was, so I think it is it is seeping out, you know, and whether it could become hegemonic in enough time for us to save the planet, I don't know. But uh, you know, you know, like the, the you know, I think capitalism will do it to the point, and like capitalism can completely reorganize their economy in one year. Yeah, yeah, they did it in World yeah, War Two. Yeah, 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 yeah. In America. It was illegal to make a car for like seven years. Like, think about that. America, yeah. right? They literally went, no, lads, you're making tanks. Yeah. You know? So they can do it. Yeah. You know? Like, if it actually comes to it, they could literally decarbonize the entire planet, probably in five years, yeah. if they wanted to do it. Yeah. And I, you, you look at, we're reading Marx, uh, we're doing a reading group on volume one, and they were talking about how how the working class in England were basically just getting to a stage where they were getting not really able to reproduce. They were getting smashed so hard and capitalism reformed. And Marx was going like, this was not a victory or anything to do with left-wing stuff. This was literally a systemic response to a systemic problem. And I do expect like that kind of emergency stuff to happen when it needs to happen. But up until that point, They'll they will pushing. fuck you yeah. until they can yeah, possibly absolutely. fuck you. Now, there's a chance they might hit a tipping point and they can't reverse it, but like, you know, and maybe that's a 5 or 10% chance that they'll actually release all the methane from the Arctic and then we all go up in one bloom and then all life, all non cellular life on the planet dies for the sixth time or something and we have another Permian mass extinction event. You know, could but, be. Yeah. I'm, yeah. On that bright note, <laughs> let's call it a night. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. On this episode, you heard the team tune, the order, the pharaonic jesters and The Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit and Swampside Chats. Uh-huh.